Oh, I was wondering what Tara was going to do with me and my, um, my uh, question annihilator there. But um, yeah, I, uh, I learned about Bitcoin about nine months ago, um, just reading some technology blogs and stuff. And I happened to mention it to one of my students in my class, um, Matt Steiner, who happens to be the content coordinator here. So he said, hey, could you give a talk about Bitcoin? And I said, well, yeah, I mean, it'll give me a good excuse to learn more. I thought it was a really neat idea. I thought it was a neat idea that was definitely worth sharing to people. And so I said, yeah, I'll, I'll learn as much as I can, and hopefully I've learned enough to try to explain it in a brief little time period here to you guys. So to understand Bitcoin, you go back to the source. Okay, so it was originally developed, the ideas were originally presented in an in a self-published paper by someone calling themselves Satoshi Nakamoto. Okay. This was in 2008. He posted it. He posted a paper with this idea. Nobody actually believes that this person is named Satoshi Nakamoto, but he's done an incredible job of hiding his identity. Nobody, no, still nobody knows who actually that person is. But by 1999, uh, excuse me, by 2009, he had developed a software that implemented the ideas, released it as open source software, and now there's a whole team has grown to help develop that software, to improve it, to refine it, and it's open source so anybody can get involved. So, and nobody still knows who Satoshi is, right? So, to understand Bitcoin, you really have to think about money, and you have to think about what is money? Not just that I'd like to have more of it, or I'd like to be in the 1% that has it all, <laughs> but I'd like to think about money. Does it have any real value to it? What makes a $20 bill worth more than a $1 bill? It's not more useful than a $1 bill. Okay? And what makes that happen, why a $20 bill is more valuable than a $1 bill, is because we agree that it is. Okay? And that's what's called a, a fiat currency, or a fiat money. And it's a, it's a currency that we just agree has value. We agree to the value. Maybe the government sets the value, but we just agree to its, its value. Now, with the, with the fiat money, you have nothing to back it. There's nothing, no value to back it. Um, so we used to be on a gold standard. We went off of that like 40 years ago. And, well, that's probably a good thing, because when you want you want something of value to have its own market. So gold is actually a good metal for a lot of things. And so you'd like to have its own, have gold have its own supply and demand, right? So its price is set by how valuable it is and how much there is, not by um, some government's currency. So we have a fiat money. To, to really start thinking about money, you gotta go back to cash, okay? So why, you know, we have cash, um, cash is great, um, cash is great because it's anonymous, if you're into illegal activity, you use cash, right? Um, but the anonymity also makes it bad because it's easily lost, it's also easily stolen, right? Um, I quit carrying cash probably 20, uh, not 20 years ago, 15 years ago, right? And I realized I didn't really need to carry cash. Um, because I was always afraid of losing it or having it stolen. Living in Berkeley, um, a lot of my friends had their cash stolen, and so I always kept a $20 bill on me just to say, here you go, let me go, <laughs> um, and I'll be on my way. And so, but I didn't really need it, all right? I just didn't need cash, and it was just too, too easy to lose. It's not tied to anybody, right? It doesn't have your name on it. The $20 bill in your pocket is, has, does not have your identity on it, okay? So, it's also very hard to send cash to people, right? Because you, you transfer that through many hands, and if one of those hands happens to just put it in their pocket, nobody knows. All you know is that the person you send it to didn't get their money, right? So we all know not to send cash through the mail. So checks, checks came about, right? Checks are actually tied to people, right? Your name is on the check. You write the name of the person you're transferring the money to on the check. And so that makes it not valuable to anybody in between. So we send checks in the mail all the time, and we do that so that we can make sure that the person 
who we want to give the money to gets the money. Right? So checks are great until you get a bounce check. Right? So um, merchants hate checks. Um, my wife used to own a children's shoe store in town, and I, I, I was always furious when I would get a bounce check. Um, and because you can write a check for any amount of money you want. I can give you a check for a million dollars. I certainly don't have a million dollars in my bank account, but I can write you a check for it. Right? So, you know, checks are bad for merchants, really, because it's actually a, a good way to steal from a merchant, right? You take their goods, you give them a check. Four days later, the, the merchant's bank calls and says, hey, this check's no good. You know, what are you going to do about it? Well, you basically eat the loss. Right? So, so merchants hate checks. Credit cards, well, credit cards merchants like to an extent. So credit cards put the onus of getting paid onto the credit card company. Okay, you're having the purchaser of merchandise pay the credit card company. The credit card company pays you. Well, that's great because then you don't have to worry about a bad check. You get paid. But that comes at a cost. And if you've ever owned a business or accepted credit cards, you realize there's all kinds of fees and service charges involved. There's transaction fees. There's percentage of sale fees. It really can cut into a small business's profit. And in fact, you know, I was always just amazed at how much they cut off the top by accepting credit cards. So you want to think about maybe how, how can we evolve this? We can see that things have been getting more and more virtual. Okay? So one thing that you have to think about in any kind of transaction or any kind of currency is that you need trust, right? You need to trust whoever is carrying that current. Uh, money from one person to another. You also need to trust the governments who are making monetary policies, the banks who are making lending policies, and so you, you put a lot of trust in maybe not, you know, not enough people, right? So one thing that Bitcoin tries to do is crowdsource trust. And I think that's a, that's a really, really interesting idea that can probably be used for all kinds of things. So how, how do you crowdsource trust? Well, crowdsourcing trust is essentially done through peer-to-peer -peer networks. Okay? So you've got everybody connected together in a peer-to-peer -peer network. So how do, you, how, do, how do you make them do trustworthy things? Well, you give them an incentive to do trustworthy things. Okay? So what Bitcoin has a built-in social engineered part that basically makes every in, the incentive for every individual to do the right thing. Okay? So if every individual, if they have an incentive to do the right thing, you can be pretty sure that on average, a crowd will do what's best for them, and what's best for them is best for the network. Okay? So you can, you're basically using people's own self-interests to help the network. So crowdsourcing trust is one thing. Another thing that Bitcoin uses is a blockchain. And a blockchain is essentially the backbone bone of Bitcoin. It's, it's a big database of all the transactions that have ever been made with Bitcoin. Okay? It's like somebody hacked into your bank, downloaded their database, posted it on BitTorrent, and now everybody has it, right? Which doesn't sound like a good thing, right? Because now everybody knows how much money you have, who you paid who, what you bought, what you spent, how much, how much you make. But what Bitcoin does is it uses cryptography to help anonymize, anonymize the, uh, the, the accounts in the Bitcoin, in the Bitcoin database. And it uses that with public and private keys, which are pairs. You give out your public keys, you keep your private keys, and in Bitcoin we call it, we keep it in a wallet, a private key wallet on our computers, and those are attached to each other. So you, send your, you put your public keys out, okay? so it's just like you think about it on a mailbox. You put your public keys on a mailbox, you tell people to put money in there that you want money from, 
They go to the mailbox, put in money, and then you have the private key that unlocks the mailbox, right? Well, that still says that, well, we have a whole bunch of addresses, right? What if somebody knows what my public address is? Well, then they can figure out, go to the blockchain and look at all my transactions. Well, the nice thing about Bitcoin is that it uses really big numbers, okay? And when I mean really big numbers, I don't mean a trillion, I mean a quattro vigintillion, right? What, what is that? Well, that, that's one with 75 zeros after it, right? So that's how many ad, addresses there are available to Bitcoin users. How, how big is that? That's about the same number as atoms in the Earth, right? So what you can do is you can essentially just make a new address for every transaction. Now it's really, really hard for anybody to piece it all back together, okay? Who did what, when, what? Because, you know, every address, how many addresses have I used? Well, I may have used a thousand, okay? I may have used a million. Uh, take a million off of that, no big deal, all right? So, it, it uses really big numbers so that you can basically have one address per transaction. The other thing that it does is it uses hard problems. Because you, you, need, to, you need to have some kind of proof of work. And the proof of work is but basically builds the blockchain. Because if you don't have any proof that it's working, you, you, you need to, someone could come along and just change it, right? Someone could go into that database and say, oh, I don't want to pay him that money anymore. I'm going to erase that transaction, okay? So you need some proof of work. And Bitcoin uses the solution to hard problems as a proof of work. Now, hard problems, I don't mean hard problems by solving a Rubik's Cube. Okay. Hard problems, people, some people are good at solving Rubik's Cube, some people aren't. Hard problems are, are problems in which it doesn't matter if you're as smart as Einstein or as dumb as a monkey, you can solve it the same. Which means that there are problems that are only solved by guessing. Okay. So you just keep guessing and guessing and guessing until you find the solution. Okay. It's very much like you know, hacking a password, right? So if I have a password, if I make it four, le four characters long, it's gonna take your average computer about, well, almost instantly to figure out what it is, okay? So I have my, my hash of the password, and then if I use a capital letter, well, it's still pretty instant. A, a computer's gonna crank through all the combinations of letters and figure out my password very quickly. If I use my full and last name, well, now I'm up to 170 days. Okay, it may be, may be good if someone got, got the database and got my hash password, they could spend some time to figure it out. If I use a capital letter, now I'm up to about 1,000 years. Okay? So you can change the difficulty of the problem by thinking about how, hard, how difficult you make your password to, to hack. Okay? So there's secure passwords and there's insecure passwords. So, what I want to do is kind of illustrate how a, a Bitcoin transaction works here. And so we, we have Bugs Bunny here um, who, needs to, who needs to pay Pepe Le Pew some money for, um, for bailing him out of jail. Okay, let's say, and, and, and you know, Pepe knows, knows not to accept a check from Bugs. He also doesn't take credit cards. <laughs> so they say, all right, let, let's do this transaction in Bitcoin. So they, all, they both have their computers. They have their blockchains on the computers. They're running the software. Bugs generates a transaction on his computer. What's he do? Well, he sends it to the cloud. So now it's out in the network, everybody to have. Well, who else is in the cloud? Miners. So Bitcoin miners are people who are working to solve these hard problems. And anybody can be a miner. Basically, you use your, use your idle CPU time to mine Bitcoins. And right now, and the Bitcoin network is basically making about 15 trillion guesses per second at solving these problems. Okay? So Yosemite Sam here is shrugging away as a computer, um, picking random numbers, trying to solve this problem. He takes Bugs' transaction, adds it to his block that he's working on, and eventually he solves the problem. So he's happy, he figured out the solution. So what does he do? Well, here's the incentive. 
he takes the first bit of that block is a $50, 50 Bitcoin reward. He pockets that, okay? So that's your incentive to, to behave, right? He takes the rest of it and bundles it up as an unlocked link in this blockchain. So then he sends that out to everybody else. They can easily confirm that he found the solution and they add it to the blockchain. And so that's how the blockchain gets built up. So I can't say that I'm gonna be paying my kids' tuition in Bitcoin. I don't know. All I know is I think it's a really good idea. There's some really, really clever ideas in there. And if it's not Bitcoin, I think money has got to evolve into something like Bitcoin. Something that doesn't have borders, something that doesn't connect to politics, something that doesn't connect to bureaucrats. It's basically money for the people. Okay? So I, I feel pretty strongly that, that this gets, it's pure money, money without politics. So I'd like to thank the, uh, the Bitcoin development team for helping me understand all of this thing. And you know, the devil's always in the details. So there's always all kinds of little interesting details about Bitcoin and you can learn more at bitcoin.org. Thank you very much.